Hey, good morning, everybody, fellow Texans from across the state of Texas and other uh, states across the country, because we know we have folks watching us from all over the United States. I'm Orlando Sanchez, and this is our weekly Facebook Live on the Texas Latino Conservatives Political Action Committee Network. I just created a network. <laughs> and uh, so we're delighted to be with you today. We're gonna spend about 30 minutes with you talking to our fabulous guest, Rick Figueroa. Rick is a dear friend of mine, but besides being a friend, he's a businessman here in Houston. He's a leader in our community. He is an active uh, conservative. He is a member of the board of directors of the National Rifle Association. He is on um, uh, Trump's uh, uh, committee. Uh, I'll let him explain to you what he does for the president of the United States. Uh, he lives on a ranch in Brenham, Texas, and commutes to Houston, Texas, where his uh, offices are. He is a uh, recognized financial advisor here. And uh, so we're going to spend a little time talking to Rick about business, about the Latino community, about the importance of education. And of course, we're going to talk about uh, politics and what we can do, which, as you know, is our mission at the Texas Latino Conservatives Political Action Committee and our 501c4 is to educate, motivate and engage the Latino community to participate in the conservative movement uh, in this country. We know, all of us know, as Latinos, that we're all, uh, we all hold conservative values, but a lot of times our voices aren't heard in the halls of leadership at the state capitol, at the city hall, and at the federal government. And so we want to highlight leaders like Rick Figueroa to tell us um, what we can do to engage more Latinos in the political process. But for now, let me introduce to you, I'm sure those of you that watch us every week, my dear friend Andrea Gomez, who le va a dar la bienvenida. Vamos a nuestro Facebook Live cada miércoles. Bueno, sí, bienvenido a Houston de nuevo, Orlando. Un placer estar contigo. <risa> de nuevo juntos, ya no estamos a través de Zoom. Ahora el que está en el rancho es Rick. Así es. <risa> Rick, bienvenido también a nuestro Facebook Live del Texas Latino Conservatives. So, Rick, uh, take uh, just a few seconds to tell us, uh, you know, I, you have uh, I have your bio here and it's like th 35 pages long, so I'm not going to read it. It's pretty <laughs> extensive. But uh, tell us a little bit about Rick Figueroa. You know, where are you from? Where did you go to school? Uh, tell us about your family. Tell us about your ranch life and then tell us how you got involved in politics and why uh, you have decided to become a vocal conservative, not just a backbench conservative, but a vocal conservative. Well, thank you, uh, Orlando, Andrea. Thank you all for what you're doing. I mean, uh, in the time right now, there's so much that's going on. And to have somebody to have a conduit for us as conservative Hispanics to be able to speak, it, it's, it's tremendous. And so thank you for that. Um, Orlando, you and I go way back, but um, my background is Bay City, Texas. And I, I grew up in government housing. I'm the youngest of eight. I always tell people that it took my mother eight times to get it right, but she finally got it right on the eighth time. And so uh, we, uh, my sisters and brothers love that when I say that in speech, but uh, she worked 36 years in a hospital kitchen. She uh, was a, an amazing person. Uh, she is an amazing person. She's 92 years old. Um, and I think she's my hero. I've met presidents, senators, CEOs, and many people, but that lady by far takes the, the, the prize. And so uh, she raised us with principles that are pretty simple. I mean, I say it in most speeches, I said, there's seven rules my mother had. They weren't complicated. She uh, said, you know, rule number one is get your butt out of bed and go to work. Rule number two is you don't expect anybody to help you. Rule number three is you help others when you can. Rule number four is you pray every day. Rule number five is you find a good woman and you marry her. You marry her. You don't just live with her. You marry her. She was very specific about that. Rule number six is you raise godly kids. And number seven is you honor God in everything you do. That's it. I mean, so uh, her, her sp Spanish was broken. I mean, her English was broken. Her Spanish is what we predominantly spoke. But um, she never really had much complication. And she wasn't trying to raise a conservative. She was just trying to get a young boy growing up in the body of the government houses of Bay City into a man. And that's all she knew. And so um, I grew up as a, a labor on a ranch. Uh, that's where I learned my ranching skills in Matagorda County. Um, so I did a lot of ranching with farmers and they, they taught me a lot of stuff. But when you don't grow up without a dad, you, there's a lot of men that come through your life that are good and bad role models. So uh, that's where I've learned a lot of my traits. And, and so um, went to A&M 
uh, on a scholarship and just, uh, you know, cut my way through life and been blessed enough to be successful, a, a wealth advisor. Um, and so I got involved in politics just by uh, the nature of my business. I, I chase money. Uh, that's what I do. And there's not poor people buying $500 plates at, at, a, at a political function. So being a wealth advisor, that's how I did. And then from that, I met Governor Perry and uh, I met Massey, the Laurel and Jacob, and they introduced me into some of the appointments position. And, um, you know, I did work at the Judicial Council and did some other things and got recognized. And uh, Governor Abbott is seen uh, gracious enough to appoint me to chair TDLR. And, but uh, I kind of knew that the reason I, I started being a, a, awake is that I started looking around these political rooms and there were no Hispanic voices at all. It was it was predominantly Anglo voices. Uh, there were some African-American voices, and, and but there were very little, especially um, in the conservative uh, lane uh, voices. And I'm thinking to myself, most of those seven values that I espoused to you earlier uh, were conservative values. And uh, I would tell you that there's probably not a Latina mother that wouldn't want those seven values to be instilled in their kids. I haven't met one yet. And so uh, I figured there's a there's a miscommunication there's a lack of ambassadors and uh, we need some more. And so I got involved and um, during the 2016 campaign, um, I got a call from uh, Kellyanne Conway about uh, joining the advisory board of the president or he was candidate Trump then. And I thought, I'm a Rubio guy. <laughs> it's like, I, I thanks a lot. I appreciate it. But, uh, you know, there wasn't a bunch of Latinos and, and Latinas jumping on the bandwagon of Trump back then, if you recall, it was Ted Cruz, Rubio, there's a whole lot of other things. And, but I went to New York and met him and I, uh, you know, we can talk about that, but I, I, I understood his perspective, understood what he was trying to, to achieve. And, and, uh, that's when I came on board and, um, the good Lord, uh, saw it that he wins and he won. And so, uh, he's asked me to step back on the advisory com uh, for his campaign. Um, and so a couple of things that we've spoken to though, that, that he's asked me to do in the last three years is economic opportunity zones were a big conversation that we have in prisoner reentry. And so, uh, and the advisory board to the president, and when we transition from candidate to president, uh, those were the two big champion items that we in the Hispanic advisory board got to help out with. So I was honored to be a part of that. So it's very timely that you talk about uh, economic opportunity zones. I know that there are several of them here in Houston. We have several. Uh, economic opportunity zones, but you're also talking about transitioning uh, back into society from the prisons. Um, and it's a great discussion. It segues really well to what's going on today, which is, um, you know, the whole country is focused on the uh, uh, the the African-American community, but it really translates into communities of color uh, about disparate treatment. And I'm not talking about just law enforcement. I'm talking about uh, here's a conversation I was having with somebody this morning, Rick. Um, if here in Houston, uh, where we are, you know, the energy capital of the world, the best medical center in the world, home to several uh, Fortune, uh, you know, 100, 200, 300, and 500 corporations. One of the things I've noticed is if you look at the board of directors of major corporations, is the lack of diversity, and. Um, it, is that an issue? I mean, should we, should, we as conservatives, we don't, you know, a lot of times we avoid the conversation of racial and ethnic politics, but should we as conservatives, economic conservatives, freedom loving, free market uh, supporters, be concerned about the lack of representation by diverse communities in corporate boards around the country? I think it's a huge issue. Um, but I think there's two parts that knife cuts both ways. Uh, one, I think there is a like, but two, do we deserve to be at the room? Right. I think that's, that's important. I don't want a, a, uh, a seat just because they want to placate to the Hispanic community or African. Anyway, I think that's, that's it, it, because it does more damage than good. When you have no representation, it's one thing. When you have poor representation, it's exponentially worse. So if we have somebody at a seat who doesn't deserve to be there, it's going to make us even look worse. So we need qualified people who are well equipped to sit in that seat, but to have a lane and a mentor into that seat, I think it's important. As you all know, Orlando, you've been in business a long time. It's not what you know, it's who you know. Um, the positions that I've achieved have been based not because I'm, you know, I like to argue that I'm so good looking, but that, that's, apparently that hasn't gotten me far. So, but uh, it, it's been based on people that who've 
reach down. Uh, uh, Champ Fraga, he's an icon here in, in, in Houston. He's been an amazing gift to me. Uh, George Donnelly, prior to that, you, Orlando, have broken a lot of, there are a lot of people, but, but also Anglos who have reached down and, and helped pull me in to the room. Uh, how I got on the NRA board was based on an African-American who allowed me in, into that uh, room. So uh, I, I think there's two parts to that. We walk in there bold and well-equipped, but we have to get the door open to us. So I think both are, go hand in glove. You can't just have one. If you open the door to people, who are not qualified to be in that boardroom, it is going to go very poor for, 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 for one for, for us, because they're going to have that connection that Hispanics are not capable of handling that position. And two, it could do them damage that would shut the door even tighter for the, for the Hispanics that are prior or, or after that position. Uh, Rick, I'm a mother and, and, what you say, it's a totally true that you said it. I, I don't know any Latina mom that doesn't want to put those values on their kids. I'm a mother of two and I'm, I'm always like working every day to bring those values. What can we tell our new generations and our the parents that uh, they're immigrants, but their kids were born here? How to keep those values all the time and don't forget where we're coming from and always um, put that on our kids. Um, I, I think that uh, um, it's just a broad question. Um, I would tell you that for me, from what I see, I, I, we have a ranch and we run about 400 people a year through our ranch. We do a uh, Youth for Christ, which brings juvenile felons out here. Most of them are, are kids of color, Hispanic and African-American. These are people, kids that were incarcerated below the age 18 that come out to the ranch. And you hear their stories and there's a theme, right? There, there's two themes that I think is important um, to set your question up. One is I see a lack of family. Um, I think that's important and specifically fathers. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I have four kids. I've been blessed with four kids, two daughters and two sons. Um, and um, I love my daughters immensely. I love my daughters, but I can never teach them how to be a woman. Just can't do it but their mother could never love them like their daddy loves them. And I love my sons, but I can never love them like their mama loves them. But my wife is amazing of a woman as she is. She's never going to teach my sons how to be a man. Right. And I think there, that the good Lord had a reason why he created two units that are different in need to create a family. I think that's important. I mean, you can call me what it is, but I've seen it in my own life and an absentee of my father and what I missed and what I had to understand as a man. And my mother's an amazing woman, amazing woman. She never had the ability to teach me. I had to, I had to grab from other people, other men, how to be a man. And it wasn't her fault, but I needed to be awakened. So I think to your question, this generation uh, seems to have been sold that it's okay that you don't have two parents or you have this bifurcated or fragmented family. I think there's consequences for that. And I, and I really do believe that. So I, I think that's number one. Number two, I think that we don't have a, 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 a racial problem. We don't have an economic problem. I believe we have a spiritual problem. Uh, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a spiritual warfare that we're fighting, and people have forgotten that um, evil exists, and uh, evil does not like unity. Uh, and I think that when people have a connection with their faith and a true faith, and they see people differently, there's a self-sacrifice mentality. And I think um, this generation has been um, allowed to dilute or dismiss faith, not religion. And then there's a big difference. Religion's man-made. Faith, I think, is God-made as well, just a, a crutch or a, um, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I mean, in those seven rules, God was in there three times. And mm -hmm. so um, I think that we have, and I, and in, there is no economic, there is no board seat, there's no economic stimulus package, there's no economic opportunity zone, there's no uh, uh, second chance prison reentry that's going to compensate for that depravity or that lack of spiritual awareness. Because I think that we as a community have failed to reinforce the importance of that. And, for, and justifiably so, because I think people have, have been uh, jaded by seeing a lot of hypocrisy of people of faith and said, well, that's just not for me. So we got to own it. People of faith have to own the fact that we haven't represented it well. But I think that leads to your two 
sets your question up that if we get those two right, I think the, the principles will fall in place uh, because I don't necessarily try to excel because I want my mom proud. That used to be the case. I think I want my mother proud of me and that's part of it. But I excel because I see the spiritual warfare that we're at. And I, I see life through spiritual eyes, not just the physical. Rick, uh, I want to talk to you about the importance of education. Um, as you know, in urban areas in Texas, um, you know, we can't hide from the fact. I, I've been, in, as you mentioned, in public life, in, in elective office or as a candidate or involved in the conservative movement for the last 25 years. Um, and I am deeply, deeply concerned about the quality of education in the state of Texas and urban areas, which mostly affect people of color, meaning Latinos and African Americans, and even, you know, the Caucasian kids that are having to be sent to uh, public schools. I had a, I have a dear African American friend that I served on the Houston City Council with, and he asked me uh, a question the other day. I think it was him, or it may have been somebody else. But for those of you that don't live in Houston, we have a predominantly African American school called Yates High School, which, by the way, is the school where the uh, Gre Gregory was killed. I mean, that's where he graduated, the man that was killed in Minneapolis. Uh, uh, he's a Yates graduate. <clears throat> and, and somebody asked, is the valedictorian at Yates at the same level of education as the valedictorian graduate at Memorial High School? My answer was no. And I think everybody in the conversation agreed. To me, Rick, that's an injustice. I think every child deserves an equal and excellent education. And as you mentioned just a moment ago, I don't think that people of color, Americans of color, whether they be Latinos, uh, uh, African Americans, Asians, we don't want seats at the table because of affirmative action. We want seats at the table because we can make a contribution, we're qualified, and we, we can contribute to this great nation. But how do we get there when our system of education, particularly in urban, tech, urban Texas, is so poor. So, um, two parts, and, and I'm passionate about this. Um, I grew up in Bay City, but I didn't go to public school. I, I had a Knights of Columbus scholarship and I went to the private school, Catholic school. And I was in government housing and I hung around about eight guys. And out of eight of us, only one of us went to college. Guess who that was? The guy that went to private school. And uh, out of eight of us, four of them incarcerated. And, you know, and one of, you know, so there's, you know, I wasn't any smart. It was just an opportunity that was given to me because the scholar, I know the power of education, but the education only opens a door. People have to be proactive and take advantage of the, of the education themselves. But, you know, I think the schools are set up for failure because they're being asked to be the family. They're being asked to mm -hmm. to feed, so supplement the family, to give principles where where a father and mother should step in in a certain ways. The schools are being asked to do, it and they can't. If the schools were just asked to educate and focus on education, and that's it, not feed, not babysit, not discipline, mm -hmm. not give guidance, but just ask, I think they could do an amazing job. But they're so tasked with trying to augment the lack of family that we talked about that they can't do it. An institution, I don't care how great it is, will never replace a parent. It's not possible. There's no way an institution can do that. And you're asking an impossible task. Oh, and by the way, I want you to educate my kid. I want you to, I want you to parent it and educate my kid. That just was crazy. But I think the second one is parents aren't given choice. I think school choice is a no brainer. I mean, if, if it, 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 it was, it was, it's, it's to me allowing a parent to choose something better than, you know, if a parent has a private school option, but they can't because their taxes go to public school. That's not, I think that that's a big deal. But I think the, the, the last point I'll tell you, I chair Texas Department of License and Regulation. We govern three yeah, licenses. I'm a real estate agent in Texas and I'm up for uh, relicensing. So I want to make sure I get my license. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make sure I'll make sure that uh, I'll, we'll see that application get to pointed to my desk and I'll make sure we get scrutinized very thoroughly. <laughs> um, but uh, I manage wealth. And the reason I chose uh, well, Texas Department of License of Education, because it governs tow truck drivers, electricians, uh, it governs uh, AC repair. Real right. estate agents. Right. And so we have this challenge, though, 
where as a wealth manager, most of my clients didn't go to college. They're just business owners. They make pipes or they manufacture something. You don't have to go to college to be a millionaire, but we've lost a little bit of the vocational um, value. We've, we, we've, we've idea. We, you know, we, we, we maybe send a kid to college to get some general studies degree and he's, or she's a barista at Starbucks when maybe they could have welded and built a business being a welder or a, a, a manufacturer or something. Um, so I think that our educational system may be too focused on forcing kids to go to college. Now I went to college, I've got a master's degree and, and I'm, and I'm very well pleased. But like I said, a lot of the millionaires that I manage their money were guys who just built a business and who were bootstrap people. And so they were vocational workers. Um, they were welders, they were, they were, they're trash men, they're, uh, they're air condition repair. They own a company, the AC repair. You know how much money AC repair companies make in Houston, Texas in the summer? I mean, um, it's it's tremendous. I mean, we're, we're, you know, from the hours of eight to four, we'll be there. Okay. And we're saying, okay, thank you for showing up, please, you know. And so uh, I think vocational uh, emphasis is a big part of it and that we might be dismissive. I, I, I took shop when I went to high school. I didn't see that as an option for one of my kids. I love what you're saying. I mean, uh, you are totally, uh, you couldn't even say it better. I totally agree that education is started at home. We, the parents, are the one that educate our kids in the values. A school just need to concentrate and educate them in math, in history, in geography, in all of those things. But the, the education that stay with you forever, that it doesn't require any PhD and any uh, uh, any MBA or any degree in um, in college. That education stay with you forever, and parents are forgetting about that. Parents, and especially, I mean, I see the difference in this country because I grew up in Colombia, and when I came here, I see the big difference. Here, they have two, three different jobs to be able to pay their bills and and to bring food to their tables, and the schools are the ones that doing babysitting and doing everything except the parents. And they're not focusing on the values with the kids. They're just don't care what the kids doing and they're just let them do whatever they want. And, and it's, 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 it's not freedom. It's just like, they're not paying attention to the kids. And they're, that's why you're seeing kids in drugs when, in, when they're 12, 13, 14, and we're seeing in a younger, um ages these days and and i think that's that's very important that we need to uh focus on that pay attention to our kids and and bring those values back because totally agree with you we forget about what is family i mean we're just uh, even in christmas we forget what is christmas about it it's just not about the gifts right. it's just it's other things and you know what this uh pandemic that we're we going through it teaches a lot of lessons and it brings us back uh, home and back inside of us. And, and even my own experience is like, it's been amazing with my kids. You know, like I have like, I feel like I have my kids back. Uh, let me follow up before you comment on Rick, because I've had a conversation with some uh, leaders here in the Houston area, political leaders, people that I have served with and people I have a lot of respect for. Some people believe that some of the urban problems in major cities in America are intractable, meaning the, the, the destruction of the family, uh, the lack of faith, as you talked about earlier, is, is so massive, it's so far gone, that some don't believe we can get it back. Um, I'm concerned about that, and uh, I, I wanna hear your thoughts. Do you believe that the problem is intractable because the answer, as Andrea says, well, that schools ought to just teach. Okay, well, those families that are working two and three jobs, what do you do with the kids? I mean, government steps in to help them. I mean, government meaning the taxpayers, right? We, we, we have so many children in the urban area and poor children uh, that are on school lunch programs that are in, but, you know, if we don't step in as taxpayers, um, and that, of course, is government. What do we do? And is the problem intractable, in your opinion? 
I, I, I disagree with the intractability of the problem. I, I, um, I, 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 I don't want to say I'm an internal optimist, but I see history. And I think history is indicative of the fact that when persecution is at its peak, change is the most opportunistic. And I think when the Christian faith is never grown, when it's been fat and happy, it's when it's being challenged and when we're being pushed. Right. If you go back and look at the times in history, the faith, our faith as a Christian has always been pushed. And that's when it grows. When it's been fat and happy, it doesn't do anything. And I think that the need for for Christians now is so great because you're right. We're in a fragmented, angry, bitter, narcissistic world right now. Um, you, you alluded to to the to the fact that uh, our urban problems, um, you know, the church is, you know, people forget. Um, I think it was I don't know. It was Rick Warren or somebody. But when Obama was taking about it, talking about Obamacare, he brought some pastors in and he started lecturing them about hospitals and health care. And I think Rick said it so eloquently. He says, Mr. President, with all due respect, it was the church that invented the hospital. Right. It, it came out of the church. Right. It wasn't the government that invented the hospital. Schools were based on church and the body has to step up and fill in the gap of the urban uh, need, whether it's uh, to help take care of kids, because I think that's important. We, you know, it, it, it's there's a there's a saying that if I'm at a pool, if we're sitting at a pool and all you and I, all three of us are doing is pulling kids out of this pool because they're drowning. Right. That's important to pull these kids out of the pool. But somebody's got to say, how come every time you pull a kid out of a pool, there's two more kids that fall in the pool? Well, go find the gate and shut the gate because you and all three of us are going to get tired of pulling kids out of the pool. If every time you pull one, two more go in. So there's got to be some resources to understand the systemic problem. Let's save the kids that need help. We have a generation here of fragmented families, of people who've dismissed their faith. And I think we have to augment what they need in order to give them the services they need, supporting the single moms, supporting the kids by giving them opportunities, and giving Max is mentoring him, reading, whatever it is, we need to step up. But then we got to say, why did they get themselves in this position? And we have to go back and make sure and reinforce the value of the family and the value of faith. Because if we don't, we're just keep pulling kids out of the pool. We're going to get tired of doing that. And so it's kind of like it, it's throwing money at a problem. We have to say, what is a systemic issue? And I, and I think I alluded to it. That's just my understanding. Because when I look at myself, I'm not, I was never a summa cum laude guy, right? I was a 2-0 and go, baby. That was me. That was it. You know, I wasn't. And, and I want you to know that there was nothing. It was just, I think it, I had certain principles that were ingrained in me. And they weathered me through the storms of life. And when you give a kid no principles, they're going to be beaten by life in every respect. And then we're going to wonder, well, let's just feed them some more money. No, we've got to go back and instill some principles in order to guide the values that or the, the, the equity that we're pouring into the kids. Or we're not going to get a return out of it. And so uh, anyway. Good. Well, good. Uh, look, I'm pleased that you believe the problem is not intractable. You think there's hope and there's opportunity, and that's great. Uh, <clears throat> let me shift gears. We're down to our last few minutes. Let's talk politics. Um, I've been involved in conservative politics for a long, long time. As you know, Rick, there's only two teams. There's a red team and a blue team in American politics, right? And... Right. Uh, uh, so I play on the red team. I wear a red jersey because I'm my values tend to be, you know, free market, capitalism, liberty. I believe in the Constitution. I believe in justice for all. I believe in our right to assembly and the free exercise and the freedom of the press. I mean, I came from a communist country. I believe all that. Uh, I'm not saying that my blue team friends don't believe that, but these are just my values. And... Uh, uh, but when I go to executive committee meetings in Harris County, because this is my county of the Republican Party, I look in the room and I see a problem. And I, you're, you're statewide and you travel nationally. Uh, I, I'm just saying on the conservative side, how do we get more people like you, like me, like Andrea involved at the grassroots level of the conservative movement and make them leaders. 
I tell people all the time, my Latino friends, here's a complaint I hear from Latinos. The Republican Party doesn't reach out to us, doesn't invite us. And I tell them, they're never, you're never going to get invited to the party. you got to show up. you got to suit up. you got to dress up. You got to put on the bow tie, got to knock on the door, you got to start campaigning. And so I encourage Hispanic, conservative, pro family, pro free market people to get involved and become grassroots leaders, meaning precinct chairs. How do people like you and I and Andrea and everybody that's watching us that are free market conservatives encourage our Latino brothers and sisters to get involved in the political process at the very grassroots level? And that is, the precinct level, because the precincts, most Latinos don't understand the precinct chairs are the executive committee of the local Republican Party. How do we get them involved? It's a, it's a two prong approach. And man, I, Orlando, you, you, uh, you have, you, you, you've broken so many ceilings and I thank you for that because it is a, but sometimes you're the lone voice at the room, the conservative Latino voice. That's not, that's a problem, right? That's just, it is what it is. You need support, but it's two prong. You have to evangelize, the people in power and you have to evangelize the people you want to come and the two evangelism methods are different um i'll i'll, I'll let's see the address the people in power My, when i give a speech i say reagan's quote was hispanics are are republicans they just don't know it right that's a that's wrong reagan was wrong republicans are hispanic they don't know it right and that's important this delineation, because it's one thing to say, Orlando, you're like me. Well, then you're like, well, I don't know. But Orlando, I'm like you. That's a different sentence, right? And people in power, the Republican Party has to be aware that they have to evangelize differently than saying, well, the door is open if you want to come. And they have to be acting. And some leaders have taken on that and said, yes, we need to be more. And, and remember, politics is a sales game. Whoever wins 51% of the sales wins. People confuse politics with common sense, which is a bad mistake, right? And people confuse politics with ideology, which is a bad mistake. It's a sales game. It's all it is. Who sells 51%, that's when they, they win. So I didn't make these rules. I'm just telling you what I know. And so it's important that the optics as well as principles are both in line in order to get the sales to where it needs to be to sell the 51. And, and we can't just ignore the optics because we think principles supersede it. So I think... You have to evangelize the people in power. And you said the red or blue team. I don't know if they're red or blue. I say they're two tools. The Democrats and the Republicans are just tools. And right now, those tools are being handled by a certain round of people. That's it, right? The Democrats are being hijacked. That tool is being hijacked by the far left, okay? that It's just a tool. That's all it is. There's no team. It's a tool. And some whoever controls a tool controls, controls it to do what's, its work. We have to, we, the team is, is, is us, conservatives. It's not the Republican Party. It's people that believe a certain principle. That's the team. And we haven't unified under that, not just being a red or a conservative, but just, and then we need to understand that the Republican Party is a tool that we need to apprehend to do our work. That's all, right? I don't want to be glad, I, I'm glad you mentioned that. I've been having a conversation with some friends and I don't want to hijack all the time. I'll give Andrea the last question, but- you know, what's sad to me is, as I'm watching TV, uh, this is a personal comment. I don't know. You can either agree, disagree, or just pass and say no comment. But I think the lighting in showing the images burning and being, you know, in the riots, because that is the image that's being blazoned into the minds of most Americans about the African-American community, I happen to know that 97% of the African-American community is going to work every day, struggling to put food on the table, educate their kids, make a contribution. They're my fellow Americans. And I just hate to see this 24, seven day a week coverage of the small group of anarchists that are being brought in to deface not only our businesses, but our African American community, and I, I just think the media is delighting in this. Well, well the media. I, I mean, I've true. often said that to the, my my African American friends, your worst enemy is the American media. <laughs> well, but 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 they're 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 a tool, right? And they're being right. apprehended by the left. Okay. Uh, 
uh, uh, corporate America is a tool, right? These, these are tools that are used and the, the true teams are these people that are conservative, principle driven, get your butt out of bed and go to work people versus you owe me, give me what you owe me and be, and I, and I'll, and I might be grateful. Right. There's a there's a value systems that are that are that are at war here, not Republicans and Democrats, it's the value systems. And what's happened is the apprehension of these tools, media, schools, um, Republican Party, Democratic Party, uh, politicians, donors, whatever it is. These tools have been apprehended by these actors that are playing against these two teams. Right. And we just need to make sure we understand the rules of the game. This confusion is a powerful weapon. And, and, and Americans are confused about a lot of this stuff because they're just, they're overwhelmed. And, and so, but that's important, but the Hispanics, so I talked about the evangelist Hispanics and you Orlando, of all people that I've ever met nationwide have always beat this drum is you got to get out there. You got to get out there. You got to get out there. You got to get granular. Politics is, 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 is a shoe leather and sidewalks, shoe leather and sidewalks. And, and it is right. And it's bringing those people who are indifferent or they're very, um, dismissive about eh, i don't care and i used to coach a peewee football team in belleville texas which football in belleville is a religion just for the record right <laughs> and uh i i had a day where kids were sick and they weren't showing up for the team for the game and um i was running low on players and i grabbed this little boy and he, and he was sure by his shoulder pads i said i need to put you back in because coach coach my leg hurts oh coach coach i said son i need you in this game and i'm going to put you back in this game and only two things are going to happen. Either you're going to hit somebody or somebody's going to hit you. But that's it. In politics, only two things are going to happen. Either you're going to affect politics or politics is going to affect you. But there is no in between. Don't act like this isn't your war. You're being affected whether you like it or not. And you're, anybody's dismissive attitude is a, is a permission to be randomly taken and blown away by the wind at any by any's discretion. And that's sad. And people need to wake to that. They need to, this politics is going to affect you. I don't care what you think. I don't care if you're in the corner of, of, of Montana, you're going to get affected by politics and the policy. And so putting your head in the sand is not going to do any good. So that evangelism has to go back and awaken these people and say, hey, I'm going to get affected. Maybe I should have a say in this. Just maybe I should have a say in this. And so hopefully they'll, they'll do that. That's why I got involved. Awesome. Well, uh, Rick, thank you so much. And I wanted you to watch uh, a video, especially, you know, like everything that you've been talking about it, like why you're conservative and you pointed seven uh, different things that why you are conservative and why we need to rescue these values for our families. So here in the Texas Latino Conservatives, we started a campaign of uh, inviting people like why you are conservative. Tell us why you are conservative or why you um think that you believe more in conservative values than other things. So um, we record a video with Orlando inviting everybody and uh, you're the one that has the, the honor to see it for the first time. And also we want to invite you also to send us your video uh, with these seven points that you talk about at the beginning of this live stream and tell us why you are conservative. So we want to feature you as we have you now in the Facebook Live and in this uh, uh, TLC Live. And also we want to uh, have your video saying these seven points of why you are conservative. So we're going to ask Jake to roll this video and invitation for everybody that want to send us their video and tell us why they are conservatives. Hi, I'm Orlando Sanchez, founder of Texas Latino Conservatives. Through our popular Facebook Live broadcast and our statewide teletown halls, we're hearing from conservative Latinos all over Texas telling us why they're conservatives. These stories range from those who have always been liberty-loving, free market okay, conservatives well, we may, their we whole lives, problem with the, to those you know, who've recently... Technology, right? So uh, <laughs> uh, I'm sure Jake will put the video up. And Jake, if you can get the video up... You whenever, can, yeah, you know, we're you talking, just put it whenever. You can interrupt us and we'll stop talking. But uh, uh, first, and I want to take this opportunity, uh, uh, Rick, to highlight... Uh, as you can see, my shirt says, I'm a, now a member of the original Barrio Boys. So this is a plug to my friends. The Barrio Boys is a breakfast club 
uh, not the breakfast club that some of you hear in the mornings with Charlemagne and the other African-American leaders. This breakfast club are hardworking, blue collar, generally Latino men, uh, kind of started in the Denver Harbor area. And we meet once a month uh, over by the Ship Channel in Houston. And so I was honored to be invited to be a member of the original Barrio Boys. So I'm sporting the shirt today. Uh, and I wanted to give out a shout out to my friends that are the Barrio Boys, the because barrio I boys. am now one. <laughs> <laughs> now you are the Barrio Boy. Okay, let's see if Jake has... Hi, I'm Orlando Sanchez, founder of Texas Latino Conservatives. Okay, I don't guess Jake. Go ahead, Jake. Jake, go ahead. Tell you can us talk, Jake. what's the problem. Hi, I'm Orlando Sanchez, founder of Texas Latino Conservatives. Through our popular Facebook Live broadcast and our statewide teletown okay, halls. Okay, that's fine. Uh, Jake, uh, Jake says, uh, who is doing a fabulous job for us. Okay, well, well, this is the idea. Yeah. So the idea is to invite everybody that uh, believe that they are conservatives and tell us why they are conservatives. Like you already shared with us, Rick, these seven points. So people may have five or more or more than seven. So we want you to go to the Texas Latino Conservatives.com slash upload Apple, i said it up, upload uh, upload okay upload. this is an english class also rick because uh, orlando always give me an english class as you were as you were talking uh <laughs> about your mother that uh, broke english so that's me and and always my kids make fun of me they said like uh, i speak like a sofia vergara in modern family <laughs> <laughs> so um TexasLatinoConservative.com slash upload. 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 Okay. And uh, they can send us a 15 seconds or 30 seconds video um, telling us why you are conservative. And uh, we're going to review all the videos and we're going to start posting it in our social media and also in our web page. So, yeah, Rick, we want you to be the first one to post a yes. video in 15 seconds why you're conservative. You may do it now. Or you may do it. go to the website. Oh, later this evening. You know, I will do it. I, I, okay. I will yeah, in fifteen you seconds or thirty seconds, tell us your seven points of why you're conservatives, and I, I love your story. And, we, and we, we want everybody watching to yeah. upload a video uh, with your phone, whatever, uh, and tell us why you're conservative. And uh, we're going to feature those on our Facebook page. I, I don't think your problem is going to be getting people to do it. Is how are you going to get a Hispanic to stop talking in 30 seconds? I don't know. I don't ah. know if that's ever possible. <laughs> no, 15 seconds. <laughs> 15. Uh, and also, I want to let you know, I, I want to let you guys know, el video puede ser en inglés o en español. The video can be in English and Spanish. It doesn't have, because, you know, I mean, maybe some people feel, I don't care about my accent and I don't care that I don't pronounce right the words, but so many people feel embarrassed. So you can send us in English or Spanish. Not everybody is that. En cualquier idioma que ustedes se sientan más confortable, por favor, hagan su video, díganos en 15 segundos, 20 segundos, lo que quieran, por qué ustedes son conservadores y por qué debemos apoyar candidatos conservadores. Now, I want to take a moment to give us a plug. We have a very special Facebook Live that we're going to do this Sunday at 6 p.m. We're going to simulcast it. Not only will it be on uh, Facebook Live, but we're going to a local ESPN a radio station. It's 97.5. Uh, I'll recall. tell you in a second. Andrea will tell us. Oh, he had the video up for a second. There you oh. go. Chaz, founder of Texas Latino Conservatives. Through our popular Facebook Live broadcast and our statewide teletown halls, we're hearing from conservative Latinos all over Texas telling us why they're conservatives. These stories range from those who have always been liberty loving, free market conservatives their whole lives. To those who've recently converted, mostly out of fear of the Democrats' far-left agenda. Some have told us that, like me, they fear the same socialist policies they fled when they emigrated to the United States. We'd like to hear from you, too. Send us a brief video on why you're a conservative. What is it about the conservative movement that you most identify with? Is it individual responsibility and freedom, pro-business policies, or perhaps the social issues that you better align with. Whatever the reason, we'd like to hear from you directly. Go to www.texaslatinoconservatives.com uploads to send your brief video. Become part of the tens of thousands of conservative Latinos that are proud of their conservative political views. Who knows, 
we might even contact you to use your video in a promotion for Texas Latino conservatives. Thank you and have a great day. All right, there you have it, a self-serving <laughs> uh, self-promotion on Facebook Live. So thank you, Jake, for working that out. Uh, let me go back to what I was telling you. On Sunday, we have a very special Facebook Live, 6 p.m. It's going to be simulcast on ESPN Radio, 97.5 FM in Houston, but it will also be streamed so you can pick it up on the Internet if you want to listen to it. It's live call-in, so if you want to make a comment, you're, so we're going to take your calls. We have some very special guests. Of course, as you all know, I served on the Houston City Council for six years as an at-large member, and I have run for mayor of the city of Houston twice. And uh, I've developed some very, very strong friendships uh, in the African-American community. And so we're going to talk about the important issue of the day, which is what's going on. This is a current event issue. And a lot of people say, well, you're Texas Latino conservatives. Um, you know, why are you getting involved in the African-American issue? Let me tell you something. I'm from the Caribbean. Andrea's from Colombia. And I can tell you that, you know, maybe 30, 40 percent of our population is of African descent. I mean, yep. we have a lot of African descendants that live in our countries. They're Hispanic, too, but they're black. And so these issues affect them. And I'm interested in hearing from my former colleagues on the Houston City Council. And so we're inviting Michael Yarbrough, who was the former uh, District B City Councilman in Houston, and his former chief of staff, a fellow by the name of Richard Johnson, who's a United States Army veteran, to be on the program. But we've also invited a former uh, chairman of the Republican Party of Texas, uh, Tom Pawkin, uh, who is also a Vietnam veteran, an attorney. He led the party here in Texas for a long time. And we, you know, I don't want to use the word conversation. We're going to have a conversation about, you know, what we're seeing today. No, this is actually going to be a call for to action. We, we want to hear from our fellow Americans uh, what we can do collectively to improve the situation for every American. So again, Sunday, 6 p.m. If you're in Houston, you can listen to us on ESPN 97.5. You can simply tune in here uh, on Facebook Live. Go to our Facebook page. We have the live call-in telephone number if you want to make comments or ask questions of our guests. So we'll, we'll see you Sunday night. Rick, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy day to be on the program. I admire your leadership. You're involved in a lot. You're a great dad. You're a great businessman. You're a great member of the NRA. You're a great leader in the conservative movement in the nation. And uh, we just want to congratulate you for stepping up and i want to use you an example so that other latinos will step up and make a contribution in our country you have the last word muchas gracias rick por nada muchas gracias por estar con nosotros y bueno disfruta tu día en el rancho con tus hijos gracias. y tu esposa <laughs> muchísimas Bye, guys. gracias thank you all for tuning in okay. see you next one rick. bye bye